Good morning, sergeants. Please start your recordings. PC recording has started. Recording Sorry. to the cloud has begun. Thank you, Sergeant Biondo. You may begin with your opening statement. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's New York City Council Committee on Aging. At this time, will all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes? To minimize any disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please do so via testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Chin, we are ready to begin. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. And I wanna welcome you to this hearing of the City Council's Committee on Aging. Today, the committee will conduct a hearing on the Community Care Plan, as well as intro number 1219, sponsored by Council Member Danny Drum, to provide assistance to seniors with bed bugs in their homes. Allowing older adults to remain at home in their community as long as possible while having access to critical services, resources, and opportunities that will support them with their daily living activity is an essential responsibility of the city. In April, 2021, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced that the city will invest $58 million in a five-year community care plan for older New Yorkers. This plan would increase services in underserved and historically excluded communities to help older New Yorkers age in place across the five boroughs. The plan also includes the release of an RFP to create 25 new centers, OAC, or naturally occurring retirement communities, NORCs, with investment towards expanding outreach and increasing transportation options, staffing, and virtual programming. In the plan, DIFTA state its aims to increase the diversity of its portfolio of providers to address historically funding inequities and include multicultural programming to appeal to the interests of varied groups, including immigrants. DIFTA plan to expand the continuum of services, including case management, home deliver meal, home care, caregiver support, connectivity needs, and transportation. While all of these are noble goals that I share, we must ensure that the plan includes concrete action and measurable follow through. The committee would like to explore what metric will use to progress of the community care plan initiative. Specifically, the committee will seek clarification on how the RFP will increase provider diversity and address historically funding inequity. How the promised flexibility to reprogram funds to support more popular senior programs work in practice and how DIFTA will reach these older adults who are not currently connected to services. The committee would like to investigate how existing older adult centers are being impacted. I have heard from providers that they have been given proposed budget much less than their RFP application proposed. And they have only given seven days time period to negotiate these contracts. Asking providers to do more with less will not help the city reach the goals laid out in the community care plan. As the aging population continues to grow, we need to ensure that the services they need expand as well. In addition to this oversight topic, we will hear a bill 
on providing assistance to older adults who are struggling with bed bugs. Seniors are often unable to carry out the physical tasks necessary to prepare for an exterminators to rid their homes of the infestation. This bill would enable seniors to receive the help they need to ensure that the exterminator can do their job properly so that the bed bugs are eradicated from the seniors' home. Thank you to the advocates and members of the public who are joining us today. Thank you to representative from the administration for joining us. And I look forward to hearing from you on these critical issues. At this time, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. Uh, we are joined by Council Member Power, Lewis, Council Member Traeger, and Council Member Vallone. I would like to also thank my staff, Kana Irvin, and Aging Committee staff, Crystal Bond, Aliyah Reynolds, and Daniel Krupp. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Council Member Drum, to discuss this bill. Thank you. Council Member Drum. Thank you very much, Chair Chin. With the city's investment in the community care plan, a greater number of older New Yorkers will be able to age in place. By creating a network of support services, we can help our family, friends, and neighbors keep their independence, self-reliance, and well-being, all while remaining in their homes. Such services run the gamut, from delivering nutritious meals to maintaining vital social connections. It is important to be aware of all the challenges that face older New Yorkers and then to deploy city resources to address those challenges. Intro 1219, which is being heard today, highlights one of the ever vexing problems that is often compounded for older adults, bed bugs. Thoroughness is key to successful eradication, but this often entails moving furniture and heavy equipment. Without assistance, many seniors would never be able to rid their homes of stubborn infestations. I have constituents who have described how chemical treatments applied in their homes by landlords and others were effectively useless because they could not take the other necessary steps. My bill would require the city to institute a program to help senior citizens eradicate both bed bug infestations, including the moving of furniture and heavy equipment if necessary. I wanna thank the advocates for being here today and I look forward to hearing your testimony. I wanna thank Chair Chin for hearing this legislation as you did in 2017 and for your leadership on the aging issues, all aging issues throughout the years and for the fantastic job that you have done uh, since we have been in the city council. Uh, Chair Chin, you're leaving a very big shoes to fill and a fantastic legacy. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Council Member Drum. I'm, I'm not sure about the big shoes. I have very small feet. <laughs> I will now turn it over to our moderator, uh, Senior Policy Analyst, Crystal Pond, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. I am Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst for the Aging Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin today, I wanna to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted. Members of the administration who are testifying will not be muted during the Q&A portion of admin testimony. I will be calling on public witnesses to testify after the conclusion of the administration's testimony and council member questions. So please listen for your name to be called. I will be announcing in advance who the next witnesses will be. The first panelist to give testimony today will be Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, Commissioner of the Department for the Aging, Deputy Commissioner Michael Bosnick from DIFTA, and Deputy Commissioner Aaron Drinkwater from the Department of Social Services will be available for questioning. I will call on you shortly for the oath, then again when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes 
which includes time to answer questions. Please note, for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at nyc. Uh, sorry, testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. The deadline for submitting written testimony for the record is 72 hours after the hearing. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath to all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath, then call on each of you individually for a response. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. Commissioner Cortez Vasquez. It's sort of simple, simple. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Bosnick. I do. Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater. I do. Thank you. Commissioner, you may get, begin your testimony. Thank you so much for that, uh, Crystal Pond. Uh, good morning, Chairperson Chin and members of the Aging Committee. As you know, I am Lorraine Colte Vasquez. I am the Commissioner of the Department for the Aging. And I am very happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about the five-year community care strategic plan. I am joined by Michael Bosnick, the Department for the Aging's Deputy Commissioner for Planning, Research, Evaluation, and Training, who will be available with me for questions and answers following my testimony. Additionally, I'm joined by Erin Drinkwater, who's the Deputy Commissioner of Intergovernmental Affairs and Legislative Actions at the New York City Department of Social Service, who can answer questions regarding intro 1219. As Chairwoman uh, Chin just stated uh, so aptly, that in April 2021, the mayor released the community care uh, plan for an age-inclusive New York City, the, uh, the groundbreaking five-year plan to guide the expansion of aging services to meet the needs of a growing and diversifying New York City older adult population. Through this plan, the city outlines our vision to support older adults to age in place. And according to AARP, we know that roughly 90% of Americans expressed in a desire to remain living at home. But to do so, many need additional supports. Community care has been shown to keep people healthy longer and to help them avoid institutional care. I know that personally as a caregiver of my 92 year old mother. Um, when people remain at home, they are more likely to be physically, uh, to physically thrive for a longer period than if they are in institutional care. The mental health also remains stronger when, re, uh, when receiving services and support in the community rather than institutions. The community benefits also by having older adults aging in place. Remaining at home allows older adults to continue to be socially connected and to bolster their communities through their high levels of faith-based and civic engagement. Moreover, there is a financial benefit to community care. While living in the communities, they help build older adults spend their money locally. They have invested in these communities all their lives and they will continue to do so. They will remain in their communities and the community should reinvest in them. Supporting an older person at home also helps decrease avoidable rehospitalization. Emergency visits, unnecessary nursing home stays. Overall, the investment in community care, including in-home services and uh, transportation as well as recreation services is about $32,000 per older adult per year. While institutional care is about $154,000 annually. So not only does it make social, uh, uh, but it also makes economic sense. DIFTA seeks to build on the community care elements already in place in order to promote independence, self-reliance, and well-being for the aging population. This 
uh, plan supports the growing number of older New Yorkers, most who wish to stay at home. But mostly we build it on this 30 year experiment we call social service aging network that has been there consistently providing supports and encouragement uh, to older adults in their community. As outlined, the community care plan endeavors to phase in essential care components, including the expansion of case management, home delivered meals, home care and caregiver support. This is particularly important with the anticipated growth in the older adult population. More people are living longer and the planned increase in marketing and outreach as a result of the uh, community care investment plan. People need to know that they can stay in the communities and that there is a network there to support, support them. That is why the future plans of the year call for increased home care, average weekly uh, hours per client to, uh, which is one of the biggest demands that we have seen, as well as additional caregiver supports, which I value greatly, and funding to assist them as they support older adults aging in place. We appreciate the advocacy of the council. You have provided in the past and even today, uh, support for the expansion of services in this administration. Thank you for that. When we, when we started this, this Department for the Aging had cut, had lost $110 million. Through the support of Chairwoman Chin, the council and others, that $110 million has been restored and much more that I will talk about um, in a few seconds. So I really wanna thank you for your support. And I'm not saying that gratuitously that comes from a long standing uh, community advocate. It is important to establish linkages uh, with neighborhood resources to build service and, uh, synergies across the network of programs serving older uh, people in the community. Some of these connections were encouraged in the recent Older Adult Center and uh, Naturally Occurring Retirement Communities, RFP. And we're optimistic that soon there will be an increased intentionality in developing relationships across community services and providers. Access to services across this community, as I said over and over, and as you have said, Chairwoman Chin, are essential. For in-home, uh, for in-person services, the community care plan outlines better use of transportation to reach older people isolated in service deserts or transportation deserts. Yes, in New York City, with the best transportation system in the world, it is, they are still transportation deserts. These include areas where it's difficult to connect with essential services due to the lack of easy and affordable access to public transport. One thing we did learn from the pandemic, virtual programming can also serve individuals living in hard to reach deserts, as well as to be more attractive to those individuals who prefer this option over in-person services. One thing that we've known is that we've seen the benefits of virtual services during this pandemic. It helped reduce social isolation and it also increase uh, services including medical appointments. The one thing that we can, we have also seen is that we can provide state-of-the-art quality services virtually to older adults at their, uh, meeting their scheduled needs. Increased programming also requires that older adults have access to critical services. Currently, we are in the process of distributing 10,000 tablets through the older adult centers to New Yorkers who live alone. This program includes a data plan as well as technology support and education. We are building on the model uh, that we had with the NYCHA, uh, with the public housing uh, tablet program last year. Finally, it is imperative that services reach across all five boroughs, expansion to underserved areas, including tri tree neighborhoods, which is a priority. Tree neighborhoods are those neighborhoods that were most impacted um, by the pandemic, which were usually the racial communities where there was racial and economic inequity, historic racial and economic in, uh, inequity. Within the provider network, expanding to the local independent providers, 
that are rooted in the community is also important to ensure the highest quality of services for that community. Additionally, more multicultural and more multi-language programs, including immigrant uh, services is important. I remember in one of my first hearings, both you, Chairwoman Chin and uh, Chairman Drum had asked that we make an investment in those uh, providers, those multi-ethnic providers that you provided discretionary funds to. We did for the last two years, we've been providing supports and some technical assistance, and we will see the results very shortly. As you know, the first year of this plan uh, was $48 million invested in this new RFP. And this was to increase services. That is one, one of the main goals. It was to make sure that we could increase and expand services. The submission deadline was in June, and we are thrilled by the enthusiastic high quality responses we received from providers, new and current. I am pleased to report that the conclusion of the RFP is imminent. At this time, all proposals have been notified if their submission has been determined eligible or not. Those who have been el uh, deemed eligible are in the process of contract negotiations, as you stated, uh, Chairwoman Chin. One of the goals of the RSP was to adjust services to reflect the changing demographics of the city, as well as encouraging further in the, in, uh, innovation and collaboration. And when I say changing demographics, I want to impress the magnitude. The African-American community increased by 75%. The Latino community doubled by 108%. The Asian American community tripled. It went from 60,000 to 180,000. That is the diversity of the magnitude that we're speaking about. And that trend will continue into 2030. We think the providers deemed eligible will be allowed uh, to realize uh, and to support these changing demographics. And we're very, really pleased by that. Once the public notice of awards is complete, we can share an official list of awardees publicly. In the, in, in the meantime, I can offer some highlights of what we expect following contract negotiations. Overall, as you well said earlier, we expect to, to increase the number of older services providers significantly. In the community care plan, we committed to 25 new centers or NORCs, and we are on track to exceed that. The committee will be particularly pleased to also hear that we, we anticipate that many current discretionary funded sites will be baseline, as well as adding new providers to the DIFTA network. Many of these sites are in underserved communities and are served by the smaller ethnic-based uh, organizations, those that you and Chairperson Drum were citing early on. I hope that the, the council will continue to use that base of discretionary funds towards services for older adults. We need additional services such as creative aging arts programs. We have found this program to be extremely uh, a successful evidence-based success and we would love to expand that. We, may, we could do that with your support. Overall, with these investments, we expect the capacity of our centers and NORCs to grow. The RFP embodies the goal of the community care plans. All are centered on keeping the older New Yorker in good physical and mental health and in a strong state of well being in, in order to live safely in their communities and home. Several key goals are innovative programming with an emphasis on collaboration within other uh, neighborhood and community resources, in, uh, increased marketing and outreach to connect people. The one thing we learned during this pandemic, and Chairwoman Chin, you've cited it, was that many older New Yorkers who were not affiliated with any program raised their hand and said, I am in need of services. And that is why we've built outreach uh, efforts into this RFP. And it was also to, uh, to reach outreach and do outreach in different languages, in the languages of those communities that I just told you were increasing. Virtual programming also is able to be increased and to reach those who are reluctant to travel to physical sites. Additionally, in the first year of the community 
can you excuse me? My boy, I'm getting messy. Thank you. Additionally, the first year of the community care plans for the fulfillment of the model budget, which was previously made uh, through the commitment of city funds, much with the advocacy of the council, uh, to begin to right size center contracts and eliminate inequities across the system. The final $10 million of uh, infusion of funds, which was strongly advocated by our chairwoman, um, was infused in the, into this model budget and was included in the F22 uh, budget, the FY22 bill. But I also want to state to build out the first year of the community's uh, care plan, we also were very mindful, as I said before, it was the mental health and the state of well being of older adults that we have also increased um, mental health services. When we started, there were 25 mental health uh, services. In the last two years, it has grown to 44. And now we, because of some additional funding from both the city as well as the state, we are able to increase that to 88 centers using the hub and spoke with the goal that every older adult club will have access to mental health services. And then finally, the introduction to 1219 which is also being heard today, which will require the Department of Social Services to work in coordination with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to establish a program to assist low income older adults with preparations necessary to eradicate bed bug infestation in their dwellings. DSS would also be required to work with the Department for the Aging to encourage outreach to eligible older adults regarding the availability of the program. Relevant agencies look forward to further discussions with the sponsor. In conclusion, I would say that many components of the community care vision that are required for it to be successful long-term are being built in the first year. We've accomplished a foundation, a strong foundation in the first year, and this would not have been possible without the council's advocacy support and dear commitment to older New Yorkers. Strategic investments must be made going forward to continue to support this targeted expansion of services. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about a community care plan. The community care plan in all its components, older adult center, expansion of services, to live, uh, dealing with tr uh, transportation services, outreach. Together we are transforming the older adult service network because our goal is to ensure that everyone who wants to be in their home can age in place with dignity and the proper support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. I will now turn it over to questions. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Chin. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Chin, please begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for your partnership throughout all these years. We have made big progress uh, with our partnership, yes, and, I, and I'm really proud of that. Uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Ayala and Council Member uh, Diaz. Uh, I would like to uh, turn over to uh, Council Member Drum uh, to ask some question about Intro 1219. Council Member Drum, do you want to do that first? If not, I guess I will, when Council Member Drum comes back, uh, I will turn it back to him. But I'm going to start with uh, some questions on the community. I'm, I'm here. Oh, yeah, okay. You want to ask some of the questions on the bill? Yeah, no, I, just, I just had some trouble getting with the uh, video. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner, I, I didn't hear uh, a clear uh, the uh, idea of what it is, are you supporting the legislation or, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't really sure uh, what your position was on the legislation. Um, I, what I can tell you is that we have an education program as part of our education program 
for older adults. We include information, including bed bug uh, uh, protocols and uh, and um, care services uh, in uh, through our senior centers as well as on in our care land. So uh, one of the things that we we know that education is a big part of this, and that we are already doing that with the with the respective agencies through our network of agencies. So, Commissioner, I appreciate the education component of it. I think that is an important part of it as well, um, particularly because these bed bug infestations can be very long lasting, and um, you know they can jump from window to window actually in apartment buildings. And so it doesn't only just affect the seniors, it affects everybody who happens to live in the building. But what I've come across now on a number of occasions uh, are older seniors who um, cannot move the furniture to get behind um, you know, uh, the furniture, a dresser, let's say, or they can't lift a mattress or they can't get the, um, you know, the, the couch out the door. Um, and there's no program to assist them with that. So that's why this legislation um, is something that I'm really trying to push for because there needs to be a way that we could help these seniors with those tasks. And oftentimes um, supers um, you know, are not willing or, or required actually to um, move furniture when you have um, an exterminator come in. So, I think it goes beyond um, just education. And that's why I continue to press for this. Um, is there any existing program right now that would help seniors with the moving of furniture and discarding of items from the apartment that um, you know, may be infested? Um, there is no program specifically for that, uh, Chairman. Um, what we do have is we have two programs that could probably uh, provide some limited support. Um, but with that said, I want to say that it's not been a problem that we've heard of, you know, extensively or widely. Uh, but what I will say is that we have the minor repairs program that can help with some of that um, mitigation. And we also have the program that we uh, provide for individuals with mental health and other issues are what we call the heavy duty cleaning for people who have hoarding uh, issues in their life and, uh, and need their apartments uh, cleaned and vacated. So those are two possible limited, very limited resources that could be provided towards this to mitigate this situation. Can I, can I told, I'm sorry, I've been told that in the past, um, that um, even with those programs, they've been turned down specifically because it is bed bug infestation and it's not specific to those programs. We could, I could look into that further, uh, the chairman and, uh, and get you some clarity on that, but, um, but it is not a program, it's not a need that has risen um, to the level, you know, uh, that 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 would deem some kind of a response. So I, I would look into uh, what the limitations are in those existing programs and um, and get back to you on that. Okay, it, let me just say, it's a, it is an issue that has risen to a, a very large um, uh, issue in my district. Um, oh. Particularly because I think we have a lot of low income seniors who um, have come to the yeah. office um, and who have um, brought this issue to my attention. Um, right. So I would really like to have the opportunity to further discuss this with you and to try to figure out, you know, if there's some way that we could include this in, in an existing program, because it's just, I have tried to, I've researched and tried to really get these seniors help short of me going to their apartment. And actually when a friend has brought this issue to my attention, that's exactly what we did do myself and my, and my, um, my legal counsel actually was to go the, was to go there and to try to help move the furniture for this person. Um, but we've had a number of cases with this and we've had large issues. We've had a number of issues just with bed bug infestation. So I would really yeah, like- I, I totally respect that. And, and uh, Deputy Commissioner Aaron Drinkwater is here to, 
answer any other questions on the actual bill and its implementation or it, the movement. Um, but uh, I, I give you my word that we will look into those two mitigation programs that we have and see how and if they can be extended. All right. Yes, thank you. And Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater, first of all, congratulations. I didn't realize that you were a Deputy Commissioner now, but uh, our friendship goes back many years, as is my friendship with uh, Commissioner Vasquez as well. But it, it, has your um, uh, agency taken any position on the legislation as well? So I think, uh, Councilmember, nice to see you. Um, I hope all is well. Um, in regards to the legislation, we have taken a look at it, um, similar to what the commissioner has indicated. I think we look forward to learning a bit more uh, from what your experience is with the constituents that you've been working with on this issue. Um, in respect to uh, just building off of what the commissioner said in terms of not hearing this as an issue, um, this is not something that our agency is hearing. We do have... Um, limited information for a slightly different client population. So the HRA adult protective services client population uh, provides services for adult New Yorkers with physical or mental impairments. Um, this state mandated program has a variety of services for those individuals who are eligible. Um, and one of the things uh, can be uh, extermination for bed bugs. So again, this is a, a slightly different universe, but in 2019, um, there was 177 uh, bed bug uh, exterminations among that client population. Um, so we're certainly interested in understanding a bit more about those constituents that you're hearing uh, that this is a problem for, uh, and then working, you know, with DIFTA to build off of uh, their programs around education and that sort of thing uh, to be able to work to come to a solution to address the problem. Okay, thank you. And you know, just um, even with the uh, repair program, the home repair program. I've been told that it's not eligible for that. Um, so, um, you know, look, look, and also, yes, they are eligible for the um, extermination. But the problem is, is that when the exterminator comes, the exterminator can't get to certain sites because when you do bed bug extermination, you have to do everything or they will survive. I mean, they, one bite from a bed bug lasts a bed bug a year. You know, they don't have to eat anymore for a whole year. So that's why I'm really pushing on this, but um, I look forward to having further discussion with you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair John. Um, Commissioner, do, does DIFTA have any um, estimate of how many senior cases of bed bugs infestation? Does DIFTA collect uh, that data? Um, we uh, don't have that data. We will be dependent on our sister agencies for that data. Uh, but it, I can get back to you and see if that data is disaggregated by age. If it is, we can give you that data uh, following this hearing. Also, do you collect data from the, from the um, older adult centers and other program? Regarding... We go in bed bugs. I mean, like we hear it. No, you know, from our no, no it, and, and. Yeah, no, we have not. What we do have is we have, you know, we con we have contracts to run education programs through our networks regarding bed bugs, hoarding, dispelling myths. You know, it's 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 that kind of programming that we do. But no, we are not collecting data on people impacted by bed bugs or. It's, it's not one of the things that we've done. Yeah, that's something that maybe do the, your education program, you should really get some more statistics because what constituent that we hear from, uh, some of them are in senior building, which they're better in better situation because there are more services provided. But if they're individual, um, it's really um, a, big, a big hassle for the seniors. And a lot of them just cannot handle it. So we just yeah. want to make sure that they're all programmed. And, good. and it's good that you look at, look at all the programs that, that we have funded to see if there could be some expansion of services. Yeah, as, as uh, uh, 
Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater uh, and I both are aligned in looking into this uh, more closely and um, getting back to you as soon as we can about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Commissioner. Yes. I mean, we're very excited about, you know, the RFP, but providers are reporting that they're only given a seven day turnaround time to negotiate a contract for the older adult center, the NORC RFP. Can this timeline be extended? <laughs> I, you know, every time we talk about, I can't have to chuckle, you know, it's because of my great love and admiration for you, but it's like, all we ever talk about is extensions. You know, we've been talking about this RFP since last June, you know, at last June, not this past June, last June. And um, we, uh, of course we will, you know, our plan, as you well know, is to get this done in November. We have to, it's, a, it's for a variety of reasons. You know, we can't wait any longer to have this kind of, you know, historic expansion. And so the goal is to, to get this done in November. I've heard some of the same issues that you've heard, you know, it's like, you know, I, I don't have enough time. You're, you're asking me to reevaluate my model budget and all of those things. And of course we're taking that into account, but our goal is to get this done in November uh, sometime and definitely before the end of this calendar year. So, but we have been talking about extensions and expansion and, you know. Well, it was I, supposed to start, what, October 1st and October 1st. It was, that. of course, it was, and, and people wanted more time, you know, of course, you know, it, it's always, you know, we had to read. The, we, we, were, we were impacted by the benefit and the gift of a lot of proposers, you know, and we had to read that, you know, remember everybody was concerned. Was anybody gonna apply? Well, many, many people applied and many rich proposals. So uh, yes, it was supposed to start uh, October 1st. And uh, had we not had so many delays and extensions, it may have, and um, but we're well on our way and we're close to the end of this. And yes, we're also obviously being mindful of those who need legitimate extensions and additional time. So also the other providers saying that they are asked to negotiate um, contracts for the network older adult centers and not, but they haven't even uh, gotten the budget for the older adult, the standalone older adult center. So uh, that, like some that, of them- that, they might, that with all due respect, that might be old information because they have received their older adult, uh, all, all contract have received their budgets and are in contract negotiations now. All right. And I think that happened late last week. Okay. Because, all right. Yeah. 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 I'll yeah. give that to yeah, you yeah, because yeah, no, uh, sure. we met with the provider, I think in the middle, in the middle of last week. Yeah. Maybe I, right I, after I, we met, then you, you gave them the contract. <laughs> nah, we didn't even, we, we, that we were on schedule. We were, we needed to get um, some of the more, you know, I, I'm going to, uh, we needed to get, you know, the, the NORCs out, you know, the number was smaller, the networks, the number was smaller. We wanted to finish those so that we can spend the bulk of our concentration and effort and dedication to those standalone senior centers. Well, I guess the, 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 the issue was that some of the providers, they have all of them, you know, they have the standalone and they have the network. So without the well, no, no, let's, let's, yeah, no, let's be clear. Some people uh, responded as standalone and some people got responded as a network and some did both. So mm -hmm. if you did both, you know, we, we let you know which one would, I mean, we, we selected the network, let's say, and then that's the one you provide. You don't, we don't do it individually. If you provided a network proposal, then we evaluate you as a network. I just want to clarify that. You don't get, you don't get, you don't get, you don't get looked at twice, you know, you're not negotiating twice. So if you have, oh, so you have a network, then you don't, you cannot have a standalone. No, because in your network, more than likely, I've not thought of one network that did not submit everybody that was a standalone for them, but they did it as a network so that they could have 
more synergy and collaboration across their programs and more fu uh, funding, uh, funding, funding abilities, more, more collaboration across funding. Okay. Yes. That, yeah. All right. That was, that was not, that was not clear to me because uh, what I'm sorry I was about hearing, that. I'm sorry yeah. that, about that. You, 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 for example, I'm going to give you uh, JASA. I don't know, JASA, JASA chose to provide it all as individuals, but PSS, Presbyterian uh, uh, Senior Services, they submitted as a network and they also submitted individually. They were funded as a network rather than funded as individuals, but in their funding, all of their individual programs are, are being addressed, all right? Okay, so you're letting me know that all the provider has gotten all their budget. I, 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 unless, unless something miraculous happened between Thursday or Wednesday night and today, um, yes, all right. So how many new standalone older adult center um, is created? And, and could you just give me the breakdown in terms of how many yeah. standalone, yeah. how many network and how many norks? Okay, um, the, um, in the stand, in the older adult centers, we went from 249 to 272. And Michael Bosnick, correct me if I'm wrong, of that 272, uh, 12 are networks, right? Are in networks. And we went from 28 NORCs to 36 NORCs. Uh, Michael, please make me honest and correct my numbers if I'm wrong. Yes, uh, just as you said, from 28 to 36 NORCs and then the uh, standalones. And I'm just checking the networks now, but what you said is either correct or very close to the number. I'll get that. I think it's 12. it's 12. It's 12 or 11. Okay. So they're like, okay, about 12 networks. Yes. Um, and within the 12 network, there are standalone. They are, they, they, they are composed of senior centers that you and I are very familiar with in their communities. Yes. So what would, what would be included in a network? Well, a network might have included another site or a social club that they didn't have before. A network might have been the exact programs that they had. I'm just giving you some, you know, for it. Mm -hmm. A network might have been all, you know, like PSS included all of its programs, right? But what they did was then they used the opportunity to collapse all those budgets and have greater flexibility and what we call fungibility between budget items and budget lines across programs. So do you also have how many existing program that would not renew as a result of the RFP? I, you know, it's, it's, we're still in the middle of contract negotiations. And as I said in the testimony, I can't, um, do a listing of, of who, um, of individuals, but I can say is that with minor exceptions, I'm talking about minimal exceptions, everyone who is existing program will continue providing services. All right, I can't, until, until the public notice goes out, until the public hearing, um, I'm, I'm, I'm restricted from sharing that kind of detailed information. Okay. Can you also share with us how many programs that the council funded through discretionary um, got into the RFP or got awarded? Oh yeah. Um, I, you know, I do have that number and I believe it's about seven um, and we're really, and what I'm pleased about with that, a uh, chairwoman chin, and Michael, again, make me an honest woman and tell what the number is. But I believe that um, what the great news about that is that I can give you the details that I can never give you the exact details of numbers. What I can say is that many of those that were ethnic uh, groups and some of those groups that you asked me to, both you and chairman 
Drum asked me to consider. Many of those have now been, uh, are fully engaged and have baseline funding. Um, and that's, that's very gratifying. And the same thing happened with NORCs. Not so much that they were some of the ethnic ones, but they were also some of the NORCs that were discretionary funding are now baseline which is why I ask in the testimony for you not to take away those dollars that have been dedicated to older adults and to keep them in the older adult network so that we don't, we don't make an advance and then lose, you know, go backwards because you've, you have worked so hard for this budget to increase that if we lose the discretionary dollars to the network, it would be a major loss. Am I supposed to say that at a hearing? But anyway, um, I, so I'm the money is there in this year's budget. I mean, this year's budget. Yeah. I think we only and, and I'm asking and, and I'm asking increase. and I'm asking for your support and influence to make sure that in perpetuity it continues to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, Commissioner, you know I'm term limited, so hopefully, yeah, I'm waiting to get a good chair. I may be committed too, agent so for next I. year, <laughs> so that they can continue to bill on this budget. Oh, yeah, definitely. Every dollar that we allocated in the discretionary funding, we're not giving back. <laughs> Great, and that, that 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 to me that to me is 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 so important. It's to all of us. It's to the network. It's important that we 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 maintain a level of support and continuity. So, in the in the two hundred and twenty nine point eight million in annual funding between all these type of programs, do you have a breakdown? in terms of how much is for the older adult uh, center, how much is for the network and how much for the NORC? Um, I don't think we broke it down that way. I don't think we had that. Um, I don't, uh, Jose, Jose Mercado is not with us today and I will get you that breakdown immediately after this hearing, all right? Okay, okay, that would be good. Uh, Michael, uh, unless, Michael, unless you have it, well, I just wanted to mention, Commissioner, um, as you said a moment ago, with all of the different breakdowns that the chairwoman is asking about, we're currently negotiating and nailing them down so that we're going to provide all that information uh, soon once we finish these negotiations. Um, and, but the numbers that you gave are definitely in the ballpark of, of the correct numbers that we're aiming for on things like discretionary becoming um, uh, fully funded, could be coming yeah. baseline and the number of networks uh, is actually a bit higher than you had said, et cetera. But once again, we've been asked not to share specific numbers until we finish the negotiation process. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when will you be able to share the official number? November 1st? October 31st? <laughs> Somewhere around there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in no disrespect meant at all, but we are in the middle of negotiating and trying to get as, as, uh, as uh, to get you the information that you want as soon as we can make go public with it. Okay. Uh, now, how does the community care plan interact with the privately run network of social adult daycare that has grown substantially in the past decade? It's interesting that you, you, you asked that question because one of the things that we did encourage and we saw some of it was to help uh, to make sure that there was no prohibition or barriers if a, if a center wanted to include more social adult daycare services in the proposal and uh, in, their, in their current proposals. And um, to the extent that we can provide quality community care plan is to the extent, um, you know, that, that we either lower the number of, of, um, of social adult daycare centers, or, you know, this is, this is vision, you know, looking in the future to see how we can tap into some of those dollars to support. Uh, more community care. And that's what I can say. Michael, is there mm -hmm. anything you want to add to that? Mm -hmm. No, I actually think that covers it well. Um, and uh, it will be interesting when we have all the results in from the negotiations, because we'll be able to see how all these different pieces have fit uh, together 
precisely and be able to have a profile we can share with the council and publicly. Yeah. And and Councilwoman yeah. Chin, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think part of that is that it would be interesting to hear like how many of the uh, the provider that submitted network RFP include included a social adult care component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, in, that, in that, yeah, that would be. And then the other thing is, on a, I know I'm not. I know I'm only supposed to answer questions that you ask, but on a related yeah. topic to uh, social adult daycare centers, the ombudsman program has been very, very active even during the pandemic, and so we're looking forward to giving you that data. Good. Yeah, we wanted to really hear how many of them were open and what they did during the pandemic because we know a lot of them shut down and abandoned all the seniors. And that's why, you know, DIFTA's providers have to pick them up or help them connect them to the get food programs and connect them to, to services. Um, and we don't even know how many of them has reopened or are they following the, um, yeah. you know, the city skyline in terms of COVID. And um, so it'll be, it'll be good to hear uh, the report right. back. Yes. Uh, now, DIFTA provides uh, an example in the community care plan of offering joint programming between a nearby older adult center and NORC so that the, um, so that the older adult members and NORC resident can both benefit. How, can, how will this pulling of resources between program uh, work in practice? And what's the budget impact on the providers? So it's interesting because that, without giving you details of who and where, I, we did see some closer collaboration in, in a community between a NORC and an older adult center to the point that we thought, let's create a funding synergy between them, you know, particularly if it was a, a, a a single sponsor. And so we saw more and more of that. And as I said, there was more fungibility being built in so that if the services that a milk provided, we encourage, you know, the health uh, services and the, and the nursing um, review of uh, that NORCs provide to be built into senior centers because we encourage them to have collaborations with local health providers. And so um, it's gonna be fascinating to, to start uh, assembling all of that data and, um, and, and seeing where that was realized. And I wanted, one of the things you mentioned uh, in terms of your opening statement was metrics. Um, one of the things that we're looking at, we're coming up with a, a very, very uh, first year, uh, baseline uh, review of the uh, comparison between what we had hoped in the proposal, what we saw in some of the proposals and start documenting that so that we can have evidence-based uh, information, you know, two years down the road to show the impact of community care and its, uh, its prevention of institutionalization. And so uh, it's one of the areas, and Michael, you may want to speak a little more to that, you know, with whatever we can share at this point. But it's been a goal that we we have it. We are aligned with uh, Chairwoman, which is let's look at this. This is an expansion. This is an opportunity. This had a goal of community care. Is it realizing that down the road? And if so, how? So Michael, um, if there's anything you wanna to add to that, it would be helpful. Yes, um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, just a couple of things very briefly. One is that, as you said up front, and what I alluded to a moment ago as well, we do wanna profile what has come out of this RFP. How are these collaborations set up and innovations? Uh, who is coming together in different ways? So as you just said, an upfront profile of that. And then we're also building into our annual program assessments how have the sites done related to collab when you ask about metrics, Chairwoman? 
uh, how have they done with um, collaborations, with innovations, with marketing and outreach, virtual programming, and reaching people in transportation and service deserts. We're especially focused on those areas. We have uh, are developing metrics in those areas tied to the annual program assessment system. So they become just a natural part of the way we look at those centers and measure how they're doing. Uh, so that will come over the next year. So an upfront profile of what's come in and then to see how that plays out over the first year in calendar 22. And hopefully okay. Michael, and will we have that up when, what's the timing of that upfront profile? Yes, we want with the upfront profile, uh, as soon as the negotiations are done and the contracting takes place to do the profile. So we want to do that by the end of this calendar year. So it'd be something that I, we can share with you, Chairman Chin, is, is still in your role as chairperson. Good. Yeah, it'll be great to, uh, I guess, and we still have hearings in November and December. <laughs> so we can get those no. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We're going to work to the very last day. I'm going to give an uh, opportunity for my colleagues to ask some questions. Uh, so... If any other council member that want to ask question, please uh, use the raise hand function. And I see that we have uh, council member Brooks Powell who have a uh, question. Council member? Starting time. Thank you so much, um, Chair Chen, for the opportunity. Thank you also um, to the agency representatives for testimony and being on today's um, oversight hearing. I just had a few questions. Um, one, in um, Queens Community Board 13, the demand for DIFTA funded older adult centers is projected to surpass current capacity by over 75% by 2030. Um, Queens Community Board 14 is expected to experience more moderate growth. How is DIFTA prioritized in areas of the city where older populations are expected to grow significantly in the community care plan? Um, has DIFTA begun identifying sites for new senior centers or naturally occurring retirement communities? Also interested in knowing um, the senior centers and providers in my district had reported um, concerns about the OAC NORC RFP earlier this year, which in past um, oversight hearings I've mentioned also. And I, I recall sending a letter to you as well, Commissioner, about um, requesting to extend the deadline. Has DIFTA received a sufficient number of application? Does DIFTA feel confident that the product, the providers will have, excuse me, that providers have enough time to initiate the contracts and deliver um, services? I'm particularly interested in th the response to those questions. I do have a follow-up on the um, on another program with DIFTA, but I want to take a moment to answer those few questions. So first of all, thank you and welcome. Uh, our council member, uh, the, the welcome to the committee. The um, it's important to know that when we set out the community care plan, we did precisely what you are asking for. We looked at each community district, we looked at its growth, and we looked at what we considered service deserts, and we started identifying which are the best ways to do that, and it was either uh, establishing, um, looking at where services were now and how could we expand those services and how could you mitigate some of those gaps either with transportation or other services. So we did exactly that. We started planning based on growth, current, but based on projected growth as to where those service gaps were. And that's how we identify where, where um, where, where uh, new programs should go with a particular attention to what we called were hysterically, uh, historically underfunded uh, communities and looking at those precisely to make sure that the ethnic and cultural diversities were being addressed. So just wanting to still understand a bit more and particularly the community boards that I, I mentioned and the concerns that have been raised. My understanding is that 
the concerns that were lifted in the letter I sent you were not necessarily addressed. Um, you know, we were in the midst of a pandemic and the, the, the facilities were expected to respond to this RFP. So that's why I'm wanting to know if there was sufficient su applications submitted because I also wanna make sure that we are truly given opportunity to the providers that are serving our communities to be able to take part in this um, and that we are given an opportunity for submissions to be provided in a real intentional way not just responding to respond. Um, so I would like to know if you have the information now we're able to, to share um, how DIFTA has moved to address these concerns in an intentional way so that the, the facilities the in my community can feel comfortable. Yeah. Thank you so much. The intentional way we did that was we provided, I believe, five extensions to this RFP. That, that was very intentional. And that was based on conversations with individuals in the city council, as well as advocates and others. So we've, we extended this RFP several times throughout the process. In addition to that, and did we get an adequate number of responders who were very um, deliberate about their responses and taking into account um, some of the innovations. We got well over 355 responses. All right, uh, I'm sorry, what were you saying? Oh, we had gotten over 355 respondents to the RFP. So we had more than enough respondents and overage of respondents to address not only current state, but also to help address the expansion. Thank you, Commissioner. And Chair, if I could just ask one last yeah. question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Um, also, I know DIFTA recently accepted applications for the DIFTA My Ride, um, the pilot program, serving as an alternative to the MTA's Accessor Ride. And my office has been getting inundated with um, complaints about Accessor Ride. And much of my district is a transportation desert. Um, so these on-demand car service options are a key part of um, filling the transportation gap that we have for our older adults. And so um, just wanting to understand how DIFTA plans to administer the program in terms of meeting the demand for the rides and providing the, the services. I know in the last oversight hearing, um, you spoke about it, but um, just wanted to use this opportunity to, to speak to the, the need emphasize the need rather, but also to right. see how DIFTA plans to um, administer the program because we really need to fill the gap. I get calls about Accessoride. Even before I was a council member, when I worked in government, I got called almost <laughs> 20 years ago about the gap. Well, um, it, is, it is a concern. And as I would always say to uh, Assemblyman Comrie that, um, there, it's amazing that with the best service system in the world, the best public transportation system, you know, uh, we have such big transportation gaps, but we know that our system was designed a hundred years ago and communities have changed since then. And we need to be more responsive, which is why these pilots are so important. So we share that, that's a common cause we have. As you know, this is a pilot, it's for three years. Uh, older adults are selected um, uh, randomly through a lottery system, you know, for, for them to apply to this pilot. Uh, it's the way it was designed, you know, it's done in, 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 um, in partnership with Department of Transportation um, and, and federal government. In, uh, and we had very, we had 14 targeted communities. Of those 14, five of them are in Queens. That goes to show you that we understand where the where the transportation deserts are. What part uh, of Queen? Uh, Queen 6, 7, 10, 12, and 14. In the Bronx, it's 4, 5, 8, and 10. So that there are four in the Bronx and there are uh, six in Brooklyn. One, two, three, four, five. Five in Brooklyn, excuse me. There are five in Brooklyn. So this is really targeted to the outer boroughs precisely to address uh, uh, transportation deserts. Um, 
and uh, and they were uh, devised. These these communities were targeted based on demographics, including accessibility. And hopefully, we can expand this in the future. It's a three-year pilot. Uh, selected older adults receive a monthly allowance for eight months so that they can have on-demand rides uh, and transportation to wherever they need to go. It's not limited to medical appointments. We wanted to make sure because recreation and shopping are just as important to, your, to breaking your social <laughs> isolation as medical appointments are. So um, that's what we're, we're trying to do. And each year we hope to bring a new cohort of older adults into the program. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, council member. Um, I also wanted to, uh, just to follow up on that in terms of transportation. Um, before COVID, if this $5 million transportation program has eight providers and it provided about 300,000 trips, one-way trips annually, um, and then 82 senior centers provide an additional 400,000 trips. Yep. How is if they're gonna improve transportation service to reach older people in isolated uh, service desert or transportation desert who are unable to use the center service? Well, we so besides hope this that pilot program, are there any plan to expand other transportation? Uh Right now, what we've done is we are looking at the target areas of the, um, of the transportation programs. And um, it is something that we're constantly, you know, trying to mitigate uh, because we know, particularly in the outer boroughs, that is a great concern. So with the my ride, it's looking at those communities, but it's also looking at new individuals within those communities every year. Um, so that we can do a better assessment as to, we know exactly where the transportation says it exists. Mm -hmm. That's not our issue. Our issue is how is it that we can match them to the services? And one of the ways we're looking at that is some of the target areas of the transportation programs. Do you, do you know the, the cost per ride and how does that compare to the SSRI? Um, I don't have that information, but I will definitely get that. That's an excellent question. I would venture to say that we are less expensive than Accessoride because it's a centralized system and ours are more locally based. But that is, uh, Michael, do we have a cost per ride for transportation? I don't have it here with me, but it's less than Accessoride and for the reason that you just mentioned. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, Chairwoman Chin, we'll get you that exact data. I don't have Yeah, that. I mean, that, that will be great because uh, I mean, unfortunately, the pilot program, as you said earlier, Commissioner, is by lottery. So, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of seniors who are in need who did not win the lottery and, and they get <laughs> left out of the program. And we want to make sure that every senior who needs the service gets it. And if it's better than, cheaper than Accessori, then we should uh, get the resources from our Accessori to expand this, this oh, program, yes. I think. Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Cheryl, I just wanted to mention one part of our evaluation of DIFTA My Ride is cost effectiveness. We are mm -hmm. hypothesizing that it's going to be less expensive to have this door to door ride for several reasons. And we're doing an evaluation and hope to, uh, we'll see what the results are, but we're expecting that it will show it to be more cost effective, which will be very important for advocating for. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that would be great. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, now, Commissioner, in, the, in your testimony, you did talk about the, um, the Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity, or the TREE, and yep. identify a range of neighborhoods that needs additional support in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So how many of these TREE neighborhoods will benefit from this new senior uh, community care plan? And Thank what will be the pre percent increase in services across these neighborhoods? Uh, first of all, thank you for the question because we targeted this RFP, especially those service gaps, to those 33 neighborhoods that were identified as tree neighborhoods. And um, we can comfortably say that we've addressed uh, 
a ser uh, the service gaps in, in many of those communities. Michael, is there any data that we could have on, um, on the tree communities and the increase in services there, the proposed increase in services, given the first blush of contract responses? Right, from the responses, again, we can't give specific data during negotiation, but along the lines of what you're saying, Commissioner, there is a substantial increase in the number of uh, CDs with tree neighborhoods that are getting additional capacity and additional sites. Uh, and of course, it's because we really targeted those areas as you were describing. Um, and then also, um, overall, the percentage of total sites, if our negotiations hold out as expected, we'll have a majority of our services in tree, uh, CDs with tree neighborhoods uh, through this RFP. And we'll be providing that data as part of our profile once the negotiations are done. So that, I mean, those were all some of the basic goals that we were going for. And um, fortunately, given the response, we were able to realize a lot of those. Mm -hmm. In, in the community collab plan, you also included uh, $2 million in funding for expanded marketing and outreach uh, by senior programs, both citywide and in catchment neighborhoods. And this is a key to uh, restoring the utilization of our senior centers after the pandemic. So what's happening now to expand marketing and outreach? And what should we expect to see moving forward? Well, I think, I think there's a two-pronged answer to that. First is, as you have well reminded all of us, um, that many older adults showed up during this pandemic who were you know, not affiliated at all um, with, and you've always told us in the last 14 hearings that we need to make sure that they are not excluded or abandoned, right? And so, that is precisely why we built in an outreach program um, and an outreach opportunity um, in, in, um, in, in the network. Because one, it's, the goal is to bring in those individuals who did raise their hand and say, I need, I need services and to see if they continue to need those services. But it's also because of what we just said earlier. These are We've made an effort in tree neighborhoods that may have not been, um, certain populations in those tree neighborhoods might not been aware of where, what services existed. And so the goal is to also reach out to those individuals in that, in that community. So I, I guess uh, one of the questions that we talked about in the last hearing about food, insecurity uh, and uh, the need for home deliver meal. So are providers gonna be getting more money for a home deliver meal, Commissioner? Are we successful in getting more funding on that front? What I will tell you is, um, I, how do I say this? The commitment to, to home delivered meals clients has been, incredible by everyone in the network, case management agencies and home delivered meals. And as you know, that one of the things that we did was um, provide additional increase in home delivered meals um, during the pandemic, because we knew that, that there was a great demand. And, um, and we did that during the RFP process of home delivered meals. And what we've also done is make sure that home delivered meals programs have absorbed many of the clients that were not receiving uh, home delivered meals, but were receiving get food. And the network has been extremely responsive, responsible in making sure that we have case management assessments as well as absorbing those individuals. But that being said, um, Home delivered meals is going to be the area with the greatest growth and that needs attention given a uh, post pandemic, but also given this commitment to aging in place. You know, people will need two services. And you said that quite aptly in your introduction, which was additional home care hours, 
additional home care meals, people can then live more independently. And so that it, we're very mindful of that. And so the first three years of the, of the plan recognizes that and addresses some of that, but the growth is something that we all as public servants need to, and as public service committed to community, uh, to aging in place, have to keep an eye towards that. So we have to, what do you guys, we have to continue to advocate for more funding for home yeah. delivery meal and home care service. And we know that there is definitely going to be in an increase and hopefully that will carry, you know, that message to the next administration that that is yeah. something that is really, really needed. Um, I was, yeah, Chairman Chin, and this was a line that, I mean, I was interviewed and someone was asking like, how many NORCs do we anticipate in New York City in the future? And what I said to them was, given the population growth and that this will be one in five New Yorkers will be over the age of 60, there will not be one neighborhood that doesn't <laughs> qualify to be a North. So there will be many, many North neighborhoods throughout the city of New York. And we need to be mindful of that moving forward. Yeah, and I hope that, you know, my colleagues who are on the committee who will be here uh, in the next term will continue to advocate for that. And as you said earlier, we wanna make sure that the discretionary funding uh, stay in place and increase because uh, we have shown by example that the, you know, the Center for Immigrant Population and the, the NORC that we have created in the council, uh, some of them has been baseline, they were successful in the RFP, uh, but we can continue to build uh, more new centers and new NORCs uh, with discretionary funding, just to get them started and then get them into the the dip of portfolio. And I think and that's just remember, that. every mm. neighborhood will be a NORC neighborhood in the future. Mm. <laughs> so every council member will be advocating <laughs> for their district. Um, so on the budget, budget question, now the RFP was for 25 new older adult centers on NORC, but more programs seem to be receiving awards. So has DIFTA increased uh, total contract funding since more NORC and older adult centers now appear to be included? The, uh, I, yes, we increased the contract level by 48 million. And so we made a commitment to 25 new. We think we were well on the way of exceeding that number. Uh, we're very pleased by that, uh, by the response and uh, the, the support of the network. So um, that money is being used for that expansion. The goal here was expansion and, uh, and uh, making sure that we could realize the model budget so that more programs, you know, especially those that were historically underfunded, were able to, to meet the needs, you know, as, we, as you well designed and together, we well designed that model budget. But you're exceeding that number, right, from your testimony. So yeah. yep. if you're exceeding yep. Yep. that number, it seems like more money is needed. Or otherwise, some programs might get short change. So we just want to be mindful of that. Yeah, um, I don't, I, there, there is no program that's being short changed. I want to be clear about that. Um, there is no program being short changed. Um, and, you know, that, that is a, a real clear statement that I feel I stand behind. Um, this was not to increase people's budget. This was, you know, that wasn't the goal. The goal here was to expand the network and make sure that we have sufficient funding for all of those innovations that we were all working towards. Okay. I know that Council Member Vallone has a question. Welcome, Council Member Vallone. Starting time. Hi. How are you? I don't hear you. Hi. Hi. There we go. Commissioner, how are you, my dudes? I am fine. Oh, <laughs> I am fine. So I, I see our two amazing chairs doing wonderful today. So I just wanted to follow up on what Margaret said on with the next council. We hope they follow because Margaret and I will always be watching. 
<laughs> and you will be more. watching from a bench, which gives me even <laughs> yes, more authority. Hopefully, God willing, after November 2nd, I can come back as a judge and gavel my hammer and say, I, I request a hearing on our amazing aging committee. Uh, thank you for all your hard work. And I know this has been a labor of love for everyone on this panel. And that is what we are always doing, advocating for our amazing seniors. Uh, I, I, you know that I've always said Northeast Queens is the true definition of a transportation desert. We have no transportation. So please don't forget Northeast Queens after I leave this area. Uh, and, and we really need, we have that one gigantic Nork uh, that we've always been fighting and working with the Clearview Gardens. Um, and that really is an example of a, a wonderful residential Nork that is the last bastion for seniors. And, you know, if that wasn't there, I, I, there isn't another affordable housing option, especially out here. So those are wonderful examples of how it works and why we need to de define and expand those Norks. So it's just a couple of uh, really good points on things that both of you have been saying today and, and me advocating and always working with Mighty Margaret. Uh, I've been happy to be her right <laughs> hand all these years. <laughs> and I wouldn't, wouldn't want to be anyone else's right hand but Margaret's. But thank you, Commissioner Faroya. Thank you. And we couldn't have a better right hand man uh, <laughs> than you, Council Member Vallone. I'm going to tell my brother that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Council Member uh, Vallone. Thank yeah. you. you. You are a great partner in yes, advocating right. for our seniors. Uh, so along with the budget question, now how will the recent enhancement in the model budget, budgeting, you know, the extra 10 million and then money for kitchen staff and congregate meal uh, further support the community care plan investment of 179.2 million over four years? It's different following the same criteria across the board. For example, funding recreation education units in a standardized way, and also staff salary uh, in the RFP look kind of low. Is, was this meant to address um, the $20 million model budget? Are there minimum salaries for the older adult center and NORC staff title like directors, program management, uh, program manager, case manager, can you share those with us? There are some staff salaries that we have uh, carefully monitored to make sure. They don't fall in the administrative categories that you're talking about, but in the, some, of the, some of the other service areas, we've been carefully monitoring that um, to make sure. And, and in terms of, I want to I want to just respond to that. The model budget was the basis by which we used to analyze what was submitted between what should be required. And the one thing that I can say comfortably without, you know, until we get the public notice, we really narrowed the gap. There were some programs that had been historically uh, over, not overfunded, no one's ever overfunded and historically funded at a, at a very rich level or a richer level um, than others. And what we've done is really worked hard to narrow that gap and lift some of those that were historically underfunded mm -hmm. to, to levels of, of, uh, of, that really reflected the model budget. Um, and so, um, when we look at the profile before the end of December, we will be able to show you exactly what that trajectory was, um, where we've narrowed that gap and where people have moved up um, in terms of their funding level. And you will, uh, we will all be really proud of the work that was done in that area. But you know, we've had, we've had a, a funding gap historically for the last 30 years in this agency. And so we've been working hard to, to bring some uh, equity funding into this network. Okay, I, I will follow up with these questions, uh, but I saw that council member Dinowitz has a question. So I'm gonna call council member Dinowitz. Starting time. Good afternoon. Uh, first, thank you for all the 
work you do for our older adults. I just wanted to quickly ask about the ex the, the transportation services. Um, you, you said or that those are being expanded um, to include more. I just I, I just was wondering what uh, factors went into the decision of how, by how much they would be expanded and where to where they would be expanded. If you could talk a little more about that. Well, I, I, I'll talk to you in, in broad terms about yeah. uh, one of the things that we did was when we did Difta My Ride, we looked at Bronx uh, 8 and 10 and 4 and 5 because we knew that those were um, a service deserts, you know, transportation deserts. Um, and so, you know, we, we particularly targeted those. Um, in terms of what we're talking about expanding them was to might expand the, the, the community area that a particular transportation program was serving. Michael, is there anything you wanna to add to, to some of the dimensions of the transportation program that were included in uh, the RFP and, and in our considerations? Right. Uh, with the allocation that came from the community care plan, one of the elements was in fact transportation. Uh, and we're going to be dealing with that in a couple of ways. Uh, the uh, RFP itself was the key way in which we dealt with it, in which we um, asked proposers to take the service desert data and the transportation desert data uh, that we presented to them so that it would help them along in their analysis and say, look at this data and you use as well your own knowledge of your community as to where these deserts are. And then when you're proposing for the older adult center and for, uh, for the older adult center, um, build in money to reach people in those deserts. And of course we don't have unlimited funds, but the community care plan did allow for the $48 million investment. Plus, as the chairwoman said, we added in the additional 10 million uh, from the senior center model budget. So there was a, a, you know, a, a large amount of money and some of that has been meant for transportation. And we do know from getting uh, the proposals in that many proposers did exactly what we asked them to do, to really zero in on where the deserts are, how to reach people in those deserts, how transportation supports can fit into that and budget for it. So during negotiations, we'll be nailing that down and then profiling that by the end of this year as part of our profile of how everything is played out, including on transportation through the RFP. Good. Yeah, no, it's very uh, appreciated and important that um, Community District 8 was included, especially as you mentioned, it is a, uh, you know, I, I guess a desert and a lot of the centers are actually on very steep hills where you have to walk over very steep hills, which as we know for older adults can prove a challenge. So, so I, I appreciate that expansion and looking forward to more transportation being available. I, I would add that in, in District 12 in, in my council district, there is another uh, senior center um, that is also on a hill, which is, you know, makes it, it's near a train, but it's also on a hill, which makes it quite challenging. So I, I appreciate you looking at all of the different aspects um, of a community district. It's proximity to public transportation, but also a topography and things of that nature as, as barriers for older adults accessing our centers. Yes, and certainly when we did the desert analysis that I mentioned, we actually did it as sort of a, well, not sort of, as actually a spatial analysis. And as part of the spatial analysis, considered things like topography as well, and highways cutting through neighborhoods, that sort of thing. Yeah. Very good. I, I appreciate that holistic approach. It's, it's not one that I think everyone takes every time. So I, I, I do appreciate you taking that approach and understanding that there's more than just, you know, bird's eye view distance from a bus stop. So thank you for including that. Yeah, That's thank it. you for that. Thank you for that acknowledgement because <laughs> from, from, a, from an older adult perspective, topography is just as important as distance. Yes, yes. It uh, could be something as simple as a crack in the sidewalk, right? A hill, yeah. uh, but that's important. So I, I it's, it's good to know that people who, uh, you know, understand and value those differences in the different community districts uh, are in charge and making these decisions. So thank you, thank you. I'm expired.
Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Thank Commissioner, you, um, following on, on the budget uh, question, uh, you know, Senior Center received the, the model budgeting, um, but the NORCs did not. So it's difficult working to make sure that, you know, because now NORCs and, and older adult center are in the same contract universe. So is DIFTA gonna address the, the salary disparity between senior center staff and NORC staff? Are they standardized now? Um, particular salaries are standardized now. Um, it is the, the professional salaries are not standardized. As you may remember, one of the things that I first started advocating for was more of a professionalization and an equity mm -hmm. of the salaries of the aging network because it becomes a barrier for a social worker to come to a senior center versus a hospital or a health center. So one of the things that we have been trying to do is to figure out ways how we could uh, have uh, more alignment and some of those professional uh, salary rates and that we can do by making sure that the aging network is seen as a um, a profession of choice and working with social work schools to get and encourage them that aging is a good place that as long as they could it's hard your heart might be there but the, the salary disparities are so great that it's a disincentive so it's one of those longer broader conversations that we need to have, which influences recruitment, which influences, mm -hmm. you know, all of those issues. But I do believe that an elevation, and I think, and this is conjecture on my part as an advocate and also as an older person and also as your ally, that to the extent that we professionalize this and give more um, credibility to this aging network and, and the profession and and resource it and have a stronger budget is to the extent that people will gravitate towards it more and more. Um, but yeah, that that's a that's a concern that we all share. You know, it's that that competition in in that particular service network uh, between the salaries of an aging network, an aging service network versus others. The same thing happens, by the way, in youth communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in terms of the budget, I mean, we heard from one provide, uh, a provider in the Bronx that is slated to receive a million dollars less uh, than their current contracts, but they're doing more work. Uh, why are providers seeing across the board cut instead of, uh, despite of all this um, increase in funding? So I can't, I can't answer a particular question, but we were surprised also by some of the budget submissions we saw, Councilwoman. We saw programs doubling the budget with the same number of service units on average daily attendance. And, and, in, and it, we couldn't see a marginal difference in the service profile that would warrant that kind of a a massive increase in the budget. So we've seen it on all sides. I can't address, no one has been shortchanged. I can say that comfortably and I can say that trans with full transparency. Um, what we have done is narrow the funding gap. What we have done is elevated some programs who were historically underfunded and programs who, who were, were uh, who were fully funded at, at higher levels have not been damaged or impacted negatively, not damaged, all right? Okay, I mean, we, we, we look forward to seeing the, the actual yeah. Um, yeah. funding and the groups that were funded. Um, we've learned last week that inflation rose 5.4% from a year ago. So are there any cost escalator in the RFP that account for the rising prices as the city council have called for? 
I believe we had some in there. Michael, can you can you address that for me, or should we wait for Mike, uh, for Jose, and get back to the councilwoman? I if believe you, that we had some course escalators in there, but Michael, yes, you're right, Commissioner. Um, in along the lines of what you're describing a moment ago, with the principles guiding our budgeting, uh, we did use model budget. Uh, principles, and that included with salaries to begin with, uh, so that we asked um, proposers to uh, actually look at market conditions. What are uh, MSWs getting in New York City and so on, so that we wanted them to build in enough money to actually pay market uh, competitive market rate. So that was kind of the foundational principle as you were suggesting. And then in addition to that, we did a model budget for small, medium, large sized NORCs, building in that same principle of look at market forces and make sure you're not shortchanging your staff. Uh, the result is that, again, we can't give specific data, but we can literally say two things. One, the majority, the actual majority of older adult centers uh, actually are would be receiving increases greater than 10% in their budget. So uh, we do see that shift, as you were saying, Commissioner, towards more funding for more centers. Uh, and then secondly, as you also just said, we did build in a cost escalator coming into the uh, into the RFP period of three years. We don't build in individual annual increases, but we do show uh, and did take into account when you look at our baseline budget that we used of FY21, what do we expect uh, inflation to be? And let's take that into account when we're factoring salaries. So commissioner, in your testimony, you were citing a figure of 32,000 per older adult per year in terms of uh, overall services um, for each adult in the community care plan. Uh, did DIFTA consider using a per head payment to programs for each senior serve since you no. cited that number? No, we did that. We did that in comparison to the cost of institutionalization mm -hmm. versus, uh, no, but we have not done that. What we did was we took the number of dollars that we spent in each one of the particular service areas that build the community service plan, and then looked at the number of adults that those that uh, budget serves. And that's how we came up with our cost estimate of an annual cost for keeping, and then of course we built in some cost escalators and population growth in there. And that's how we came with the cost per adult, but no, we did not use it as a funding formula. We use that as a comparison for the difference between keeping someone at home versus institutionalizing them. Well, would DIFTA use that for, for the senior center and North? I mean, as, as their budget, would that make any difference? I mean, you know, that's, that an, like that's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. We could probably do that calculation and see what that, how does that materially differ? But I think that's more of a, from, from if, if, if I am understanding you correctly, I think that's a great analysis for, for moving forward in terms of really building and supporting a community care plan. I think, um, I think you're giving us a, a pathway there to look at this differently um, and to build on what we've looked at already. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to uh, DYCD for youth program, right? Right. They right. have uh, a certain amount of money per youth, and that's how yeah, they Yeah, and, and they the Board of program. Education, and the Board of Education does that. And what we've done traditionally, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by this. Um, what, um, I'll put, put it forth in the transition plan. <laughs> but what I'm, what I'm intrigued by this, what I'm intrigued by this is that, um, we have always used cost center analysis rather than individual uh, person analysis. And uh, you know, we've looked at cost per meal, cost per transportation unit, and we've looked at that rather than, so that's a cost analysis rather than total cost of keeping this person in this particular service. So I, I'm intrigued by that. Well, going forward, I think it'd be good to take a look, but that's what- Yeah, I think know, we will other... do that. 
for new services, they do that. Um, you know, DIFTA has uh, the RFP in the pipeline for old elder justice and transportation, um, you know, given with all the delay and issues uh, with, the, uh, with the recent RFP. Uh, is DIFTA still planning to push through those two RFP? Yes, and they will not be completed in this administration. They will be, they will be going, first of all, I wanna, I wanna bring some, some discussion about scale which is, we're talking about five elder abuse uh, programs, all right, throughout Very the small. entire city. It's what is really small. Same thing for transportation, it's eight. And given the conversation that we've had around transportation and making sure that there is an expansion of those transportation deserts and looking at the topography issues that we were just discussing with Councilman Dinowitz, those are the things that we need to kind of like build in <clears throat> So yeah, but they're very small in scale. You know, we're talking about eight to 10 providers, five to six providers, you know. So you, you're saying that you're still gonna be able to take care of that in the next two months or just leave it to the next administration? No, we will, we will draft the RFP and issue them because it is based on the thinking of the community care plan. Mm -hmm. And so we wanna make sure that that's in, integrated into that and it will be realized in I believe they'll become effective next June. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, just a couple of follow-up questions. On the technology, you talked about the addition of 10,000 new tablet uh, for the seniors. Um, so when, when will they expect to receive that? The 10,000 seniors. <laughs> ah, from your lips to their hands. Um, <laughs> They are right now we're in, we've just, um, I think Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, we've notified the senior centers of what their individual allocations are. And, uh, and we've also given them a profile of who would qualify for that because someone has to live alone, not have access. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then where are we in that process, Michael? Right, it's um, the centers right now are actually contacting the, the list of people that we gave to them so that they can compile the list of people who indeed are proven to be eligible because they live on their own, they don't have a device. Uh, and that information is due to us this week, actually Wednesday. So after that, we can then compile the results and start to get the devices out. Okay, that's good. So yeah, so please provide us with the update on that. And also during the preliminary budget and executive budget hearing, uh, we talked about the uh, enrolling senior in the $3.2 billion emergency broadband benefit uh, that was in the December 2020 stimulus packet. And uh, have DIFTA plan to, what, what's DIFTA's plan to enroll these seniors? And do we have any number of how many seniors have been enrolled in this discount plan? That has been such a challenge with that, mm -hmm. that, that whole discount plan has been such a challenge. Michael, you wanna add to that? We can tell you that we have a range for the 10,000 who, two things I think that are good news in terms of uh, internet access of the, of the 10 million, of the 10,000, excuse me, I wish it were 10 million, of the 10,000, that uh, of tablets that went to NYCHA, the broadband was extended for another year. I believe that happened last June till following June. And um, we have built in a cost for a network or it's part of this particular rollout plan. Um, Michael, do you have, I, I don't have uh, any more information on the uh, broadband, except that it has been a challenge to figure out who's eligible, how to, how to get access to it. Um, mm -hmm. But Michael, can you elaborate on that? Sure. As we know, it's a federal program and it's based on individual el eligibility. So uh, individual people actually have to apply for it. So we did advertise that and give information to each of our uh, older adult centers. And as part of the wellness calls, we have, uh, we're asking them to make each week. 
uh, for people that they're not seeing at the center, that they advertise this to the individuals and offer to provide some assistance that they need to fill out the application. So we don't have data on that now, but we did get that word out to the centers and some information on how to apply and to help the individuals apply. So would you be able to get the data from the centers in terms of how many senior actually were able to benefit from this program? I guess that would be helpful. Um, yeah, I think, I think we should. Mm -hmm. uh, my last question is going to focus on the uh, case management and home care. Yes. <laughs> I know that we talked about there is going to be increased demand for case management and home care service in, in the community care plan. You noted that future steps along with additional funding are needed. So what new funding have been allocated uh, to meet this need? I wish Jose were here so I could tell you what we have had increased in home delivered meals. I know that there has been some adjustment mm -hmm. um, and some increases, but I'm, I know my OMB people are gonna be like, How, you should know that. I, I, don't rem I don't remember it right now, um, but let me see. So um, I know it's-, it's then send it to Send it to us. I, I'll send it to you because I don't, I don't want to overstate or understate, but I know that a lot of good work and thinking has been done in partnership with City Hall, our, our deputy mayor, uh, and OMB, uh, and obviously with you and your offices on this whole home delivered meals program. And, uh, but as you know, in year two, home delivered meals increases, the goal is to increase them and also in year two of the plan, uh, case management also increases because you cannot handle home delivered meals without attending to case management. But is that also gonna include an expansion in the ISEP program, the enhanced in-home service for the elderly program? Uh, I believe it does, uh, Councilwoman, and I'll get, I will get back to you with the details on that. Unless Michael, you can answer that right now. I think you're right. It's best that we just gather that data. And send okay. It yeah. Yeah. Because that is such a, a a great program. A lot of people don't even know about it. No. About they all all right. things. They all you know. A lot of seniors always think that oh, I have to be on Medicaid to qualify for home care, and the ISA program, even though it's not right. a lot of hours, it just uh, we have seen you know that is such a great benefit to seniors who are living alone or or they have a spouse that needs extra care. So we would just want to make sure um, that's yeah, included. Well, most of the DIFTA home care program is funded through the ISEP program. Yeah, and then New York State allocated 8 million for unmet need, including wait lists for these services. Do you know how much of this money uh, the New York City received? And what did we use it for? Um, what funding are what funding a, a councilwoman? This is New York State allocated eight million for, for unmet needs, including wait lists for like home care and case management service. I'm not aware of anything that we've gotten to date uh, on that. Um, Michael, are you aware of anything that any allocation that we've gotten specific to that? I know we've received. Um, some emergency care money, but are you aware of anything yet? This is uh... that was a discussion from the state several months ago, and again, I think when Jose does the you know summary of funding for home care and for home delivered meals, he can provide that. Yeah, but I don't. I don't believe that we've received an allocation. I know we received the earlier allocation for meals, but I don't believe that we received that allocation. So. Uh, we'll get back to you on that, Councilwoman. Okay. No, I, uh, yeah, I would. But we're always that. happy to hear that the state's going to give us more money. <laughs> they should. I mean, like, you know, aging population is growing. I mean, they got to give us our fair share since we, you know, we all pay state tax. Uh, so I think uh, whatever question that, um, that I did not get a chance to ask, we will ask, we'll submit to you and we will also uh, hear back from you on on some of the, the question that you were not able to give us the uh, information on. So I thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and uh, 
Deputy Commissioner, for joining us uh, in this hearing today. Lorraine, I'm going to, we still got two more months to go. So two yes, more years to go. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. And use we're going to time to advocate for as much as we can. And we're, gonna, and we're senior. going to get as much done as anyone can in the next, I think it's 81 days left. <laughs> we are going to pack it in. Look at what right. we've done just with mental health. Look at what you yes. look at what you've done with older adult centers. So I think two months is a long time in our life. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's great seeing you and uh, stay you. well. And Thank we you will so continue much. to work on it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to pass it back to our committee council to call the, care, the public panels. Take care, Commissioner. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now begin public testimony. The first panelist in order of speaking will be Kevin Jones, Brianna Payton Williams, and Jeremy Kaplan. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given five minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order you raised your hand after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer, then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would like to now welcome Kevin Jones to testify. After Kevin Jones, I will be calling Brianna Faden Williams and then Jeremy Kaplan to testify. Starting time. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Chen and members of the City Council Committee on Aging. My name is Kevin Jones, and I'm the Associate State Director for Advocacy at AARP New York, representing 750,000 members of the 50 plus community across New York City. Uh, I want to thank you for providing us with the opportunity to testify at today's oversight hearing to discuss the community care plan and the city's investment in New Yorkers age, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, investment in helping New Yorkers age with dignity in their communities. As many of you participating already know, Older adults are one of the fastest growing populations in New York City and will continue to make up a greater portion of the city's total population in the years ahead. New York City's older population is also becoming increasingly diverse as the city has seen the most significant growth of adults above the age of 65 in Black, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islander communities over the past 20 years. And it's anticipated immigrant New Yorkers will make up more than half of the city's older population very soon. In addition to the growth in New York City's older population, we have witnessed a growing desire among New Yorkers and others across the country to remain in their communities as they age. In a national survey that AARP conducted back in 2018, we found that 76% of Americans above the age of 50 said that they would prefer to age in their current home, and 77% stated that they would like to continue living in their community as long as possible. However, we found that only 59% of that of those uh, believe that they would be able to remain in their communities as they grow older. These demographic shifts and changing sentiments among older New Yorkers will require the city to adapt to the growing needs of this population, as well as ensure that older adults have access to high quality services and continuum of care that will allow them to age with dignity in their homes. However, the city's budget for aging related services continues to remain woefully underfunded as the Department for the Aging's budget remains about half of a percentage of the city's total budget through FY22. We also know that many of the city's neighborhoods that are witnessing the fastest growing adult or, uh, <clears throat> older adult populations lack access to nearby older adult centers or NORCs. Additionally, the uh, OACs and NORCs that operate in low-income communities of color have historically suffered from inequitable funding allocated by the city and therefore um, impact uh, their impact and ability to deliver comprehensive and quality age-related services to their clients is diminished. We commend the city for the recogni recognition of these issues and for their recent efforts to address them with the launch of the five-year community care plan, uh, <clears throat> uh, along with their initial investment of $39.4 in the FY22 budget. We're eager to see the opening of 25 additional older adult, uh, excuse me, older adult centered NORCs uh, focused in historically underserved communities of color, as well as the expansion of community-based aging services to meet the needs of the city's older populations as it continues to grow. 
We believe the city's expansion of community-based services and programming for older adults is a critical step toward helping more New Yorkers remain in their homes and age with dignity in their own communities, which has been shown to often improve both physical and mental health outcomes, as well as avoid stays in nursing homes and related facilities. These investments into community-based care uh, and services have also been pr uh, proven to save taxpayers money as these services can reduce the frequency for older adults to be hospitalized or placed in a nursing home. However, as the city begins to allocate community care plan funding to providers in the, in the coming months, we encourage the mayor and DIFTA to ensure that these funds are distributed equitably and involve cities, uh, the city's full network of local community-based organizations in the process. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we've witnessed how the city's network of local nonprofits and community-based organizations went above and beyond to meet the increased demand for meals, health services, and other vital programs among the city's population of older adults. These organizations are a key piece to ensuring that older New Yorkers are provided with the culturally competent and high quality services in their communities in the years to come. In addition to the funding that has been already been allocated under the community care plan, we urge the city to set aside funding in the next budget cycle to provide older adult centers and NORC's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, NORC providers with additional funds that can uh, use they can use to invest in technology and technolo technological literacy services, excuse me, in order to help address the digital divide and improve access among older adults. Thank you for giving me the time to testify today, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I would like to now welcome Brianna Payton Williams to testify. Time starts now. Hello, I'm Brianna Payton Williams, the Communications and Policy Associate at Levon, New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Levon, New York's members include more than 100 community based nonprofits that provide core services which allow all New Yorkers to thrive in our communities as we age. As the city works to build back a better future for New Yorkers, the stakes have rarely been higher to ensure older New Yorkers have the support they need to safely age in their communities. The community care plan works to recognize these stakes, investing in funding and articul articulating the increase in demand for services that is likely to be experienced in the coming years. However, implementing a five-year vision amidst a global pandemic in which providers are struggling to stay afloat and which the uncertainties of the new normal loom large has largely made it clear that there is still work to be done. Today, providers have begun receiving award letters for the Older Adult Center and Newark RFP and are starting, to, are starting the negotiation process to prior to contracts going into place. Unfortunately, initial reports on this process have raised significant concerns on if investments made in the care plan are sufficient to fully fund the number of contracts it seeks to execute. Representative of this, we are hearing of the city urging providers to enter into contracts upwards of a million dollars less than was proposed within the provider's application. In response to these challenges and others that we have heard throughout the RFP process, Levon New York recommends DIFTA must extend the timeline given to RFP award winners to review and enter into contracts. Currently, DIFTA is giving providers just five, five business days to submit budget documents and scopes of work. This is in response to budgets and units that are vastly different from what was originally proposed. Second, the city must retract its position that providers enter a 10% diminutive indirect cost rate when finalizing contractual budgets and instead commit to entering into contracts with each provider's indirect cost rate. Third, given the diverging bottom line budgets between award and proposal, the Department for Aging must provide further context and justification when responding to award recipients in a way that significantly alters the proposed budgets or units. And beyond the RFP, the Community Care Plan articulates growing demand for services critical for older New Yorkers living in communities, including case management, home delivered meals, home care, and more. And to truly address these invest, um, to truly address these increases in demand, Live on New York recommends the following, an investment of 16.6 .6 million to serve existing clients within traditional home delivered meal program, um, invest the required funding to the get food client transitioning to the home delivered meals co contracts at a higher rate, 
as well as expand investments in case management to ensure all clients can be screened for case management eligibility and receive the critical services they should be eligible for. And additionally, Live on New York strongly supports the Bill 1219 that would provide assistance to older adults with bed bugs in their homes. Everyone should be able to safely age in their homes without the fear of bed bugs infesting their homes. And this act would provide older adults living in housing residences with the necessary support and services to eradicate bed bug infestations in their home. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Uh, I would like to now welcome Jeremy Kaplan to testify. After Jeremy Kaplan, I will be calling on Philip Chong and then Peter Kempner. Time starts now. Thank you and good afternoon, council members, and thank you, Chair Chin. My name is Jeremy Kaplan. I am the executive director at Encore Community Services, a nonprofit serving older New Yorkers on Manhattan's west side from 110th Street all the way down to 14th Street. We offer a range of services to help seniors age successfully, including operating an older adult center. We were just approved for an older adult network in the theater district. And we also provide home delivered meals in residential buildings and more. Over the past 10 years, the number of older adults in the city has skyrocketed. The 65 plus population has increased 12 times faster than the city's under 65 population and now represents 1.24 million people across the five boroughs. And these numbers are only continuing to grow. We were thrilled by the announcement of the community care plan this spring, and we applaud the city for beginning the rollout. The plan is an important step for our city in expanding services that support the health and wellness of older adults. Services including older adult centers in Norks, with an emphasis on community partnerships, continuity of care, virtual services, and congregate programming are key to successfully aging and avoiding institutional care. That said, as the plan takes shape, we do have a couple of concerns. I could not agree more with the commissioner when she said that strategic investments need to be made going forward. While the community care plan represents a sorely needed boost to senior services, our city must consider long-term needs of older New Yorkers. In the November budget modification, the administration must fully allocate out your budgets um, that are needed to sustain these contracts for which funds are not currently in place. Without proper out year projections, the contracts will face a fiscal year cliff in, in 2023. Furthermore, in order for the community care plan to be one that is truly comprehensive, the long-term food security needs of seniors must be factored in. Many of the HDM and older adult center contracts interact with one another, our kitchens, our, our facilities are in, inextricably linked. We need better infrastructure. The, reinforce, the reimbursement rate for the home delivered meals contracts are capped at $2.20 below the national average for urban areas. New York City can do so much better by our older New Yorkers. We urge the city to invest $16.6 million to serve existing clients within the traditional home delivered meals program. Increasing the HDM rate will also demonstrate foresight to the fact that many recovery meal participants will qualify for home delivered meals past 2022. And right now there is absolutely no plan for them. The program will require critical infrastructure enhancements reflecting the rising costs of food, changes in the labor market, and heightened cost of insurance, gas, packaging, and storage. It is critical that we build on the good work of the community care plan and create a strategy for addressing the needs of older New Yorkers for many years to come. Thank you to the council. Thank you, chairperson and members for your time today. Thank you for your testimony. I would like to now welcome Philip Chong to testify. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Council Member Chen, Speaker Johnson, members of the Asian community, and Commissioner Lorraine Cortez Vasque for your time and the opportunity to speak to you. My name is Philip Chong, President and CEO at Quincy Asian Resources. We call ourselves Corey with the acronym a nonprofit immigrant social service agency based in New York City, Massachusetts. 
So we've been serving the Asian immigrant community since 2001. We provide wraparound services in youth development, family support, food security, um, so social justice, adult education, and workforce development. So during the pandemic, Corey has been working tirelessly to help support our clients to access food, vaccination, comfort, and important information to navigate the unprecedented challenging time. In 2020, Corey was awarded as the Anchor Pan Asian Meal Provider uh, to prepare and deliver culturally sensitive meals to elders and vulnerable families across all five boroughs. In the past 12 months, we have delivered over 1.8 million meals to the people in the New York City. As we all know, the pandemic has created many barriers and challenges in all aspects of our lives. We face as many challenges as you can imagine from limited resources, supply chain di disruption, labor shortage, and increasing food prices. As an immigrant and Asian American myself, like many other immigrants and refugees, we fight for our survivors and advocate for others to ensure they are being taken care of. For the silver lining through this program, the Get Food program, our immigrant restaurant owners could reopen and provide hundreds of employment opportunities to the immigrants communities and elders show their appreciation and call us to say how much they enjoy the Pan-Asian meal that we provide, especially during the winter time when the major snowstorm make our door-to-door -door delivery to become extremely challenging. But we know we cannot give up because the elders have been counting on us. Unfortunately, we face even more challenges when we witness increasing Asian hate crime in the city and across the country in the last 20 months. Elders that we serve continue to raise the question to us whether they make the mistake to move to this country. In May, Corey worked with two community members, uh, Juliana Lee and Wang Nguyen, to distribute whistles to the elders in New York City, Los Angeles, and Massachusetts. In thinking about how they could help support vulnerable elders, they connected with Corey, and the whistle against AAPI Hay Project was born. In New York City, Corey partnered with City Harvest at its mobile food pantries Charles B. Wong Community Health Center, New York Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, Protect Chinatown, and NY Visiting Nurse to distribute these whistles to the elders. As we think of many of our parents and grandparents and their vulnerability as AAPI elders, we hope that whistle will provide a sense of protection from potential harassment and harm. And a reminder that the community is standing with them Giving the little control we hold over random acts of violence and hate, even small things can have a big impact. Each whistle is accompanied by notes in Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and English to share our message to the elders that their community is listening and standing by with care and support for them. We know our work cannot stop here when the GAFU program is coming to an end in November. With the track records that we have, we developed a multilingual dis, uh, digital platform for SNAP recipients to purchase fresh produce from the local farmers. In the meantime, we're planning to launch the nation's first clean energy power mobile food distribution network, focusing on plant-based in New York City to provide access to fresh produce and culturally sensitive meals to our elders and vulnerable families. What the pandemic has taught us in the importance of distributing timely and effectively to our clients. As a department agent and the New York City Council work together to devise a strong vision and community care plan that will determine for our city, innovates the senior service system to be more responsive to the needs of our immigrant seniors. We ask you to keep immigrant center providers and voices at the table. We are looking forward to collaborating with DIFTA in different innovative ways to help support our elders and their family members. As the Corey slogan says, we are immigrants supporting immigrants. We are strong and we're immigrant strong. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I would like to now welcome Peter Kempner to testify. After Peter Kempner, I will be calling on 
Alexander Riley, and then Jill Bloom, or sorry, Gil Bloom. Stephen. Time starts now. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Kettner, and I'm the Legal Director and Elderly Project Director at Volunteers of Legal Service. VALS was established in 1984, and our purpose is to leverage private attorneys to provide free legal services to low-income New Yorkers to help fill the justice gap. Our Senior Law Project focuses our services on helping low-income New York City seniors plan for the future by obtaining wills and other advanced directives. This planning allows seniors to ultimately make their wishes clear, empower their chosen caregivers, and allows them to age in place in the community for as long as is feasible. In addition to our life planning services, we operate a legal advice hotline for seniors. Legal issues related to eviction and homelessness tops the list of questions we hear from, about, from our clients. While both New York City and New York State have taken significant steps to protect the rights of low-income tenants in recent years, landlords continue to push forward with their efforts to force out long-term tenants in rent-regulated housing, many of whom are seniors. The, the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019 eliminated many of the perverse incentives landlord had uh, to force long-term tenants out, such as vacancy rent increases and high rent deregulation. The Universal Access to Council program now ensures that seniors at or below 200% of the federal poverty level receive free representation in eviction proceedings. But even as these reforms and programs represent progress in reducing evictions and homelessness amongst New York City seniors, many th threats remain unaddressed. One of the most challenging situations a senior can find themselves in is a bed bug infestation. Beyond the bites, property damage, and trauma that an infestation can cause, this is a situation that could put a senior at risk of eviction and homelessness. Many landlords are eager to bring holdover proceedings based on a nuisance claim where a senior tenant is the victim of bed bug infestation. In fact, one of the few types of eviction cases that have been allowed to move forward in the face of recent and current pandemic-related eviction moratoriums are holdover proceedings where the landlord is alleging a tenant is causing a nuisance. Many seniors who are fully willing to comply and cooperate with their landlords in taking the necessary steps to treat and hopefully eliminate a bed bug infestation may find themselves unable to do so because of physical limitations or disability. Uh, intro 1219 clearly recognizes that for a bed bug infestation to be properly abated, the tenant must declutter, bag personal items, move heavy furniture and appliances, otherwise the efforts will be in vain. Seniors with able-bodied friends and family members or those who have the financial resources to hire help uh, will be able to properly prepare an apartment for a bed bug remediation. Sadly, this leaves behind the most isolated seniors who have the least resources. These are the very seniors who, if evicted, will face homelessness because they don't have anyone to take them in, nor will they have the financial wherewithal to find safe and affordable alternative housing. I've seen bed bug infestation nuisance holdover cases play out repeatedly in housing court. The parties reach an agreement or the judge orders access for bed bug treatment. And a tenant is, and the senior tenant is unable to comply because they cannot properly prepare their apartment for remediation. Too often this spirals out of control, ending with a frustrated judge uh, letting an execution of a warrant of eviction go forward. Legal services attorneys are often able to tap into some resources from, from nonprofit agencies or government agencies to avoid this outcome, but these resources are scared, scarce and difficult to locate. Uh, the mandate in intro 1219 that the services be the subject of educational outreach campaigns will ensure that seniors in need and their advocates will be able to avail themselves of this program. Beyond the human toll of homelessness resulting from a bed bug infestation. From a cost benefit perspective, it is clearly preferable to invest taxpayer dollars in a program like the one outlined in the statute or in the bill, uh, than to pay much more to house a senior in a shelter or other type of transitional housing. In addition, homelessness leads to deteriorating health outcomes for seniors, resulting in increases, increased costs in Medicaid, Medicare. They may find themselves in a nursing home or other facility most often at taxpayer expense. Our hope is that the assistance and support outlined in intro 1219 
save disabled New York City seniors from eviction, homelessness, and the spiraling negative impact that this will have on their health and well-being. Thank you for allowing us to submit this testimony today and for, for supporting the needs of New York City seniors. Thank you, Mr. Kempner. I'd like to now welcome Alexander Riley to testify. After Alexander Riley, I will be calling on Gil Bloom. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thanks uh, very much for the opportunity to, to testify about this uh, proposed legislation. Um, and uh, well, before I, I uh, talk about how much I agree with everything Pete Kempner just said, I will say that uh, I am Alex Riley, director of the elder law practice at the Legal Aid Society. Um, the Legal Aid Society is the oldest and largest nonprofit public interest law firm in the United States. We work on more than 300,000 individual legal matters annually for low-income New Yorkers with civil, civil, criminal, and juvenile rights problems, in addition to law reform representation. So I'm within the civil practice where we have various practices, not just elder law, but employment law, immigration, health law, homelessness rights practices. Um, so yes, I, I agree and, uh, with and support everything that that uh, Pete Kempner just said, and uh, we very much support this legislation. Uh, what I wanted to contribute is just a couple of suggestions on the subject, uh, first of all, of a, a public awareness. So uh, even if this were to be implemented, uh, well, first I should say that my recollection of the, the original version of this legislation uh, called for DIFTA to, to implement this program, and uh, the, the present version uh, calls for DSS, I think, to do it with the assistance of DIFTA in terms of outreach. Um, uh, if this program were to be in effect, um, it wouldn't work if people don't know about it. And obviously that's why DIFTA is being called upon to help with outreach. But in addition to D DIFTA's assistance, um, one possibility would be to require landlords, property owners, to notify DIFTA or whatever administering agency there is, DSS, of a bed bug uh, infestation where, there, where there's known to be an older person in uh, the dwelling, just as a landlord is required to notify a marshal if there's an, uh, an older person in an eviction situation, and the marshal is required to notify APS. Um, that's one thing. And then also, it would be worthwhile for DIFTA to coordinate with other agencies, for example, the Department of Finance, which administers the SCRI and, and SHE programs to include uh, mailings with uh, uh, the various documents that the Department of Finance sends to older people um, in relation to those programs. Uh, uh, it's been, certainly been my experience, and I'm sure Mr. Kempner's too, that, uh, that uh, older people are often hesitant to report uh, bed bug infestations to their landlords, partly because they think they're going to get in trouble or they, the landlord's going to get mad. So if they if they were to know that this program exists and that there's support uh, for them out there, then I think this would also lead to more timely reporting, which would be terrific for for everyone. Last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, the the problem of older people not being able to make necessary pre uh, preparations in their apartments for bed bug eradication um, is identical to the problem uh, that arises in relation to other housing code violations. So uh, before bed bugs reemerged in New York City a number of years ago, we would still see many instances where there were uh, housing code violations in uh, older people's apartments that need to be corrected, but landlords would say, oh, well, we can't do that because, you know, the dresser's in the way or the armoire is in the way or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, our people are not going to move those items because we don't want the liability, all that kind of thing. And then uh, there would be a stalemate because the older person can't do it. They have no one in their family who can help. There's no service uh, in the city available for this. So we're hoping that in addition to this legislation, there could be legislation that would uh, also uh, require a, an agency to provide this additional, really identical sort of service 
uh, with respect to other housing code violations. Um, and it actually would be a much simpler service. It would be a matter of just moving a couple of things as opposed to the, the very labor intensive work needed to prepare for uh, bed bug remediation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I would like to now call on Gil Bloom to testify. Time starts now. Hello, good day. My name is Gil Bloom. I'm representing the New York Pest Management Association. I'm also the owner of Standard Pest Management, a New York based firm doing business since 1929. I served as one of the entomologist members on the New York City Bed Bug Advisory Board and subsequently conducted training to a number of New York City agencies and authored bed bug manuals for NYCHA and APD, HPD. I've also provided in service bed bug training to New York City DOA, uh, several social service agencies, including Sage, Heights and Hills, Dora, and Carter Bird. With this extensive background, I would like to offer the following knowledge for consideration. I would add that bed bugs can be especially problematic for seniors as they tend to react less to bites and they may not see them as well. Furthermore, they may become reservoir units affecting other units. And in addition, they may be denied health and other aids due to the presence of bed bugs. Perhaps the single most important aspect of addressing bed bugs is that successful management lies in the details and that while the macro level of prep needs to be addressed, such as limited moving of furniture and in some cases deep cleaning, it is frequently the lack of micro level assistance that results in laughing bed bugs and inevitable reinfestation, much to the dismay of all concerned, residents, neighbors, pest management and property management alike. The second biggest issue I've observed over the years is the lack of bed bug knowledge and basic preparation protocols among the assorted vendors and ad hoc prep persons. I have seen and reviewed successful cases of assistance, but far too often am aware of situations that leave much to be desired. <coughs> Excuse me. In that they exacerbate the situation through unintentional spread overlooking the important basic best practices, thereby providing for a full sense of required preparation, the unnecessary discarding of items, and at worst, illegal, unsuccessful, and dangerous placement of items in plastic bags with insecticide strips. If this proposed legislation is going to have a measurable positive outcome on bed bug management for those in need of assistance, it must be guided by sound entomological protocol and best practices, which should be consistent, but evolving in accordance with new bed bug control practices. The goal is not to make pre-treatment assistance more difficult, but rather have it provide for truly effective steps in regard to the non-chemical aspects required for successful bed bug remediation. As an example, I've attached a recent research, which I was a reviewer for, which addresses the occasional extent to which the assistance may be needed. Uh, the link is included on the document I provided. It's how to get bed bugs out of your belongings uh, by Cornell uh, Community IPM program. Ergo, I recommend the establishment of a limited oversight group comprised of health, aged, Pest Management, a representative of Cornell Community IPM program, and a social work practitioner. The goal of this group would be to establish base guidelines and best practices to which all funded services would have to abide by. In addition, this information should be made available to all New Yorkers and stakeholders, regardless of socioeconomic status, as bed bugs do not discriminate. Our concern is that misguided attempts at assisting people only exacerbates and spreads the problem. The inaccurate information such as bed bugs jumping, which they do not, they do not jump, they do not fly, you know, only creates a worse scenario. It's important to deal with a bug, you have to deal with it at the bug level to begin with, and then move up through the different agencies. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. 
At this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no raised yeah, hands, I, Chair Chin. Oh. Yeah, I wanted Chair to thank all the panelists. Yeah, I wanted to really thank all the panelists for uh, testifying, especially um, the three panelists that talked about the uh, bed bug uh, legislation. Um, and thank you for your suggestions. And hopefully we can incorporate, you know, some of your suggestions into the legislation and, and get it passed. Um, I think for, um, for Peter and, uh, and uh, let's see, <laughs> Alex, <laughs> Riley, great to see you guys. I mean, if you could provide us um, some data on terms of cases, I think that would be helpful because from the testimony, you know, you heard earlier from DUFTA and th there is no statistic. I mean, they, they're not gathering uh, information about uh, seniors that had, had to go through uh, the bed bug situation. So if there were like court cases that you are familiar with or clients that you have helped uh, with the situation, please, you know, provide us with some data so that we can strengthen uh, the legislation. Uh, and also what you talk about, you know, in terms of, um, you know, outreach education that is needed more than just giving it to the senior center and allowing senior center just to do a workshop or two, that's not sufficient. Uh, so I think we can definitely, you know, expand on that uh, process. And also thank you to uh, um, Mr. Broom. Uh, for your technical you know, expertise. And we, we can see how we can uh, incorporate uh, some of that also to strengthen uh, the legislation. So thank you again on that. Um, is uh, the other uh, panelists, uh, is it on, from Encore, is it Jeremy Kaplan? Are you still on? I think he's still here, but I, I just had a question for him. Hi. Hi, Jeremy. Great to see you again. I know Hi, I saw you last, last month on the get food part. Uh, could you just like give us, because I know you you heard from DIFTA that your network uh, was funded. Do you want to share some, what was your experience in terms of the contract negotiation, the timeline. Um, was there any obstacle that that you that you had in terms of uh, with the RFP? Sure. Um, well, we we received our notification, our formal notification, um, middle of last week. Um, we had applied for we had applied for a network, which in our case it was a small network of two centers. Um, that that it that included our our existing center, um, and and an additional one uh, for an expansion to to launch a lifelong learning center. Um, uh, we were approved for the network, which which essentially included the renewal of our additional center and and the lifelong learning center. So we were very very happy with that. Um, the budget that we so that we received was lower than the budget that we had submitted for. Um, that said, so was the um, the proposed contracted units. Um, and, you know, again, just you know, having uh, you know, having just gotten the notification um, late later last week, I haven't dug into uh, whether or not that was proportional. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I hope it was. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we uh, we were asked to turn things around in seven days, and we and we uh, told. Um, our friends over at DIFTA that we would definitely need more time, um, particularly around some of the facility um, mm -hmm. and, and leasing issues um, yeah, that we're looking yeah. into related to this expansion. Um, we are hoping um, that, that we will be afforded that, that additional time. Oh, so they haven't gotten back to you yet? Well, I just, uh, I just put in the request uh, uh, earlier this morning. Uh, so, oh, okay. Yeah, I think, I think our seven days is up on uh, Wednesday or something of this week, so. <laughs> well, the so, commissioner said that she will grant uh, I, extension, you know, when- I'm very hopeful. Needed. I'm very hopeful that we'll get some more time to, to deal with those negotiations. Okay, so that's good. So you said that the budget is less 
but you also the contract the number. Yeah, the budget um, was less, but the the units uh, it appeared to me were were less proportionately um, in mm -hmm. our case. Um, again, I need to dig into the numbers to verify that. Okay, I think one of the questions that I asked the commissioner earlier, I don't know, if provider would think about in terms of budget that would uh, calculate as a per person cost versus you know like what the commissioner was talking about right now they use like cost for meal cost for this and that but like with dycd and you know for youth programs or they they have a per uh student cost like for after school program and summer program i guess in the future they will look at to see whether that is also feasible feasible for seniors like a per cost yeah. for seniors you know I think that would be super helpful. And in fact, in, in the RFP, there was a reference to an average cost per senior, um, which is what we use to base our budget off, off mm -hmm. of. Uh, you know, the RFP also made it clear that that, that was um, just the average um, and that some awards may, you know, may be above or under that. But we found that super helpful when constructing our budget for the RFP. Okay, great. Thank you. It's, uh, it's Thank Philip. You. Uh, thank you. Is Philip Chong still on? It's, if not, it's, yeah, because I just wanted to a question about the Get Food program uh, transition. But we can follow up with him. So once again, I really want to thank uh, all the panelists, everyone, for joining us today and for your testimony. And uh, we really look forward to you know, strengthen the community care plan and fight for additional resources uh, for our older adult population. Uh, we still haven't given up on the home delivered meal, the 16.6 .6 million. Hopefully uh, that will be um, in the November plan budget mod because we know that there'll be an increased uh, cost for that. So I wanted to thank uh, all the committee staff that helped put to together, you know, today's uh, hearing and all the sergeant uh, for organizing the hearing. Um, I'll pass it back to uh, our community staff. Community staff. Chris, Crystal? Well, that concludes this hearing. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so this hearing is now adjourned at 1.38. Thank you. Okay.